halfway through January, and we're still finding out about our teams. We were awful. Louisville's coming around. And those are sort of the cards we're dealt. So was Virginia Tech. We've got a pretty good team. Even Boston College pulled a W. It's like everything else. You just got to keep building on it. But can Duke get their situation straight? We could not knock down a shot, man. Is NC State for real? You can figure that out for us, man. You would help us out. And what about those heels? It's not who we are, not what we do. Others are struggling just to get on the court. It's not a lot of fun. While others have impossible decisions to make. We've been pretty good since we started practicing, but now because of that, you know, you get shut down. Either way, we'll cover it all and more on this week's Chase for the Championship. Everybody, welcome to Chase for the Championship. Hard to believe we are roughly halfway through January and barreling towards March Madness. Fingers crossed there. Sure, there were a few cancellations and some games had to be moved around, but there were also some games rescheduled and made up, so promising. And some great games, too, just last night. We're going to get to all of that, so sit back, relax for about the next 45 minutes or so here. We're going to start off uh, with Louisville. Yeah, the Cardinals, they've been taking on and taking out everybody in conference play since that slip up with that team we will. Mention. Yeah, moving them on up to 16th in the polls. And for more, we're going to check in with WEHT's Randall Parmley, who's covering the cards. Randall. Don't look now, but Louisville may be starting to put things together. The cards picked up their fifth win in a row Wednesday night, beating Wake Forest on the road. The Cardinals knocked off the Demon Deacons 77 65. Louisville shot a blistering 51% for the game, with Carlick Jones scoring a season high 23 points. Louisville is now 9 and 1. More importantly, they stay perfect in ACC play at 4. No, now that 4 0 start, their best start in conference play since joining the ACC. In fact, it's the best start in any league for the Cards since they won their first eight Big East games way back in 2008 2009. Up next for Louisville, it's our second straight road game at Miami on Saturday. Covering the Louisville Cardinals, I'm Randall Parmley. Thank you there, Randall. Like you said, Cards head to Coral Gables. They're going to host Louisville. 8 o'clock tip on that one. Then the Cardinals return home to face another team from Florida, the Seminoles, at that KFC um, Center. That one tips off at 7 p.m. Man, i got to get out there. <laughs> Moving on here, Virginia Tech's only conference loss came at the hands of Louisville in a game the Cardinals edged the Hokies by two. Mike Young's squad gradually climbing to the top of the ACC standings, and that win against Duke Tuesday helped. WFXR's Jermaine Farrell chimes in. The Virginia Tech men's basketball team, one of the pleasant surprises on the season. Virginia Tech was picked to finish 11th in the ACC. Tech, they are proving the naysayers wrong. Now, last week, Virginia Tech had two games and three days to play all at the castle. Last Sunday, the Hokies beat Notre Dame 77-63. Then on Tuesday, Virginia Tech would beat Duke for the fourth time in the last five meetings at Castle Coliseum. Tech is now 20th in the AP rankings as they improved to 10 and 2 overall and 4 and 1 in the ACC. Now, with the strong start by the Hokies, things are looking up for the crew of Virginia Tech. I've got a pretty good team, Mark. I mean, uh, let's let's not uh, let's not beat around the bush. Um, we've got a pretty good team. I think we got a chance to be really good. We're not really good right now, um, uh, so I don't think it's anything more uh, complicated than that. I mean, that's just saying we got the potential to um, to make a run for it. You know, we just gotta uh, stay level-minded, level-headed. You know, not to get the, like the big head or anything. We just gotta um, stay humble. Uh, we're definitely a good team. I mean, we still have uh, a lot of improvement uh, that we can do. Uh, I, I think we got a good team. We just gotta keep pulling together. Now, the Hokies, they have two games coming up this week. The game on Sunday will be a familiar one for Virginia Tech head coach Mike Young. When the Hokies, they head down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to play Wake Forest. The Demon Deacons are led by former East Tennessee State head coach Steve Forbes. Of course, Forbes and Young faced each other several times when they both were at Southern Conference schools with Young at Wofford and Forbes at ETSU. Man, we had, we had some blood baths now. Um, He's a friend. I think the world of him. He's a heck of a coach. I mean, he's a heck of a coach. Stephen taking over Wake Forest with so many balls in the air and so many, and you're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. Oh my gosh, that that, that that's that's awful. Um, but the team's competing. I mean, he he hung in there with Virginia the other night. I haven't seen them very much. They haven't played very much. 
he is not playing the way he's comfortable playing right now. He's playing the way he has to play out of necessity. But I'm telling you right now, fellas, that guy can really coach. And uh, his teams play the right way. They play really, really hard. And um, he'll, have, uh, he'll have that thing up and running in no time and doing it the right way with, uh, with good kids. And I mean, they fight. Uh, they, they just fight. And uh, uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a fan of, uh, of Steven. Now the Hokies and the Demon Deacons will play each other Sunday night, 6 o'clock from Winston-Salem, the Lawrence Joel Memorial Coliseum. Then Tech returns home next Wednesday at 5 o'clock for a game at the Castle against the Boston College Eagles. Covering the Virginia Tech Hokies, I'm Jermaine Farrell. <laughs> Thank you, Jermaine. There he was talking about those two games right there. First one Sunday at 6, followed up by that other one there, Boston College and Virginia Tech. That one tipping off at 5 p.m. at the Castle, tangling with the Boston College Eagles next Wednesday. All right, and the question wasn't if, but rather when Boston College would get that first ACC win. They, they had been on top in almost every single game, sometimes by double digits. They just couldn't close teams out. This week, they finished the job in style, rolling over Miami 84 to 62, getting a check in the conference win column for the first time this year. The Eagles led by 10 at the break, shot over 50% from three point land, going 18 of 35. They only turned the ball over eight times all game. All in all, complete game victory for Jim Christian's crew. I said it for the last four games, we've gotten better. I mean, sometimes the results don't show it, but we've gotten better. Our defense has gotten better. We're getting a better understanding of what we're doing. Uh, guys are individually getting better. And we, we've played well. I mean, we played, we played really well at Duke. We played really well against Virginia. Most of our points came in transition, so our defense was great tonight. Um, and, like, once we got rolling, it was just we got in a rhythm. And, I mean, all great players get a rhythm, and, you know, the basket got wider, and we hit more and more um, – but it was mainly our defense getting out of transition, getting easy layups, uh, and that was the key for us. Not sure how it's going to be this Saturday for the Eagles as they are on the road facing the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Tip off for that game is set for 4 p.m. That one is in South Bend. Meanwhile, the Virginia Cavaliers started the season a bit rocky, but one thing about a Tony Bennett coach team, they will take something positive from each game, learn from it, and be better for it next time out. Joining me now is someone who has seen that take place up close and personal. We're going to bring on Natalie Calibut from WRICR affiliate in Richmond, Virginia. And Natalie, now do we know they can play defense, but what's been the key to success for Virginia on offense there? Chris, two words, balanced scoring. There were five players in double figures scoring against Notre Dame last night. It's been a mix of established players like Jay Huff, Kihei Clark, and some new additions like Sam Hauser. Chris, here's what Tony Bennett had to say after UVA started the year 4-0 in ACC play. I think that's important. Um, no, I do. Uh, you, you have to obviously be able to stretch it. And, you know, I think guys with Casey doing that, guys found their, their niche. And um, so, you know, again, we just keep looking for ways. We know as we go now on the road, go against, um, I think, you know, the competition. You know, Notre Dame's been close. They just haven't been able to get one. Virginia will look to uh, continue that fiery offense as they look to play Clemson. It's going to be a tough game as uh, the Tigers are ranked number 12 right now, Chris. Yeah, I know lots of uh, teams have done some different things to get through this odd time that we're living in. I mean, unprecedented is thrown around. It's, it's cliche now. But how have the Cavaliers been weathering the storm during uh, COVID absences there, Natalie? Chris, it's been a challenge for all of us and for UVA specifically. Two players and most of their assistant coaches were out. It was, it's really been a team effort to say um, the Notre Dame game was the first one in two weeks where Virginia was at full strength. Members of the support staff helped Tony Bennett out on the bench, which was pretty crazy. And younger players like Reese Beekman helped fill Casey Morcel's shoes while he was out. Of course, uh, of course Coach Tony Bennett was very happy to have Morcel back on the, on the floor. There was some good, solid defense in the first half, good ball movement. And, um, you know, I was really uh, excited to see Casey come back. I said to him, I go, practice? Practice is overrated. I said, you need to get another 10-day break. But uh, he was, I thought, really good. Practice is overrated, right, Chris? 
<laughs> we talk about practice. I mean, we talking practice here, right? Come on now. I grew up watching Georgetown. I remember how practice was. The, uh, now, now, now we're talking about a D1 college players here, and of course, there's no way I'm going to be mistaken for a D1 basketball player. But one guy that's standing out, and I'll admit I didn't expect to see much of, Jay Huff. Not the guy I was looking for before the season started, but man, has he stepped up the last few games? <sighs> Chris, I don't even know where to begin with with Jay Huff. He scored a career high 18 points in back to back games, both against Boston College and last night at Notre Dame. Uh, he made four three pointers against the Fighting Irish yesterday, which is incredible and a career best for him. He's also been a consistent um, for rebounding and shot blocking as well. So he's definitely been a pillar for this Virginia team this year. You need those people. You need those kind of folks that show up, do the job, and put together a remarkable game every once in a in a while and then show out when they have to. Natalie, thank you very much for uh, helping us out here and for keeping an eye on those calves. You got it, Chris. Thanks for having me. All right. Now, uh, we're talking about the uh, next time we're going to see these people here. Cavaliers hitting the court uh, this weekend. They're going to take on Clemson on the road. The uh, tip off for that one, 6 p.m. And after last year's dismal Carolina campaign, many wondered whether they'd actually get back to their winning ways this season. Maybe the carry over there. The committee's still out on that one, but uh, they seem to be getting better as the season goes on. With the help of some of that young talent, Alyssa Ray is here and has more. Alyssa. Hey there, Chris. North Carolina beat Syracuse Tuesday night in the Dean Dome 81 to 75 for its third straight win. The Tar Heels moved to 3 and 2 in the ACC. Garrison Brooks had a team high 16 points and 10 rebounds. Armando Baycott also recorded a double double, 15 points and 12 boards. But Roy Williams has been hoping for more production from his freshman guards, Caleb Love and RJ Davis. We saw more from them in the win against the Orange, combining for 19 points. With no preseason competition, it makes sense. It's a slow start to get these guys rolling. I keep talking about it, but when you're freshman guards in the ACC and you have no exhibition game, no scrimmages, and then all of a sudden you have two or three game or one game, I guess, before you start playing in the Maui Invitational and then get out of that and then you're in ACC play, there's no... Uh, there's no games that you can get some confidence. It's hard to get confidence playing in the ACC. Yeah, definitely. I know I've been, you know, struggling to shoot the ball. I know these past couple of games. So, you know, coming to this game, I just wanted to be ready when, when my name was called um, and just play with the confidence, uh, you know, not worry too much about, you know, misses and, um, you know, turnovers or whatnot. Just play basketball, and that was my main thing. North Carolina will be put to the test Saturday, taking on Florida State in Tallahassee. Tip-off is set for noon. Covering the Tar Heels, I'm Alyssa Ray. Thank you, Alyssa. And there you see that game she was talking about. Noon tip. That's usually one of those ones everybody kind of takes a little while to get started for. For a look at how the Seminoles are doing things, let's head on down to Florida State way to WMBB's Emma Stamps. Emma. Up until Wednesday, the Florida State Seminoles had not played in a game in 15 days, leaving lots of time for speculation as to how they would return after so much time away from the floor. And the Seminoles answered that question quickly, looking as if they had absolutely no rust to shake off as they welcomed in NC State. FSU dropping 57 points in the first half alone, up 25 at the break. And in the second half, they would just extend that lead. The Knolls beat the Wolfpack 105 to 73, clearly ready to get back out on the court. FSU shooting for a record field goal percentage in an ACC game at 71%, 67% from three, and 100% from the free throw line. And though NC State was not fully healthy, it doesn't take away from the statement the Knolls made with this being their return to conference play. Raquan Evans leading the team with 24 points. MJ Walker had 19, and Nathaniel Jack had 18 points off the bench. The Knowles played 15 guys in this one. Florida State will host North Carolina on Saturday. They will travel to Louisville on Monday. Reporting on Florida State, I'm in the Stamps. Thank you, Emma. Great job as always. Like we were saying, there game for Saturday against the Heels tipping off at noon. A little bit early for most college people I know. Knowles followed it up with a date on the road, like she was talking about at the KFC Yum Center. I just put that in there so I could say KFC Yum Center one more time against the Cardinals. Tip off of that one set for 7 p.m. And you know, it looked like the uh, Blue Devils had their rhythm figured out, but you never can't tell with a young team, which is exactly what these Blue Devils are—a very, very young team. They fell behind again to the Virginia.
Virginia Tech Hokies. The first half got so bad, Coach K put in just clear Jalen Johnson, who he said earlier in the week would suit up and travel but not play. He gave them a, a bit of a spark. Duke trailed by 12 at the break. It was worse than that in the first half, but it was 12 at the break. Then the Blue Devils stormed back early in the second half, outscoring Tech 21-10 over the first seven minutes of the frame, marking their first 12, making their first 12 shots, rather, cutting the lead to one. But they appeared to have emptied the tank to get there and had nothing left to complete the comeback. It's similar to what happened against Boston College, if you remember. And Coach K knows they, they need to do better right out of the gate. I think we learned a lot tonight in just how hard an ACC top level game is that uh, you know, you know, they, you know you have to be there for 40 minutes and that's a learning experience you know we really have not been in a game like that in the conference there was no energy uh, we were just playing lax we were letting, we were letting them come coming to us like we weren't being the aggressor it was just we were just doing everything wrong and, and then we Finally, like late in the, in the first half, we started making a little push, and then, and then obviously in the second half, we made our, we made our run. But just, just playing for 40 minutes, that's, that's the big key for us, playing for 40 minutes. Blue Devils going to be off until next Tuesday when they face off with the Pitt Panthers. Then they don't have another game till later on that week on Saturday when they take on the Louisville Cardinals. Both of those games on the road, by the way. So it's going to be interesting to see how they do away from Cameron. NC State riding a three-game losing skid. And State could have used some help last night in that 32-point loss to Florida State. But help is on the way. The Wolfpack are going to have to be a little patient, though. Kevin Keats has a really good recruiting class coming to Raleigh next season. Todd Gibson caught up one of those recruits. We're talking about Farmville Central's Quavion Smith. On more than one occasion, Kevin Keats has admitted it's tough to reel in those elusive five-star recruits. But through the years, Keats has had success finding hidden gems. Another one of those hidden gems is on his way to Raleigh next season. If nothing else, Farmville Central starter Quavian Smith is loyal. Yeah, right from the beginning, they were my first offer. I mean, I showed a lot of a lot of love from them, and they made me feel like family off the gate. So in February 2019, Smith, an unranked recruit, signed with NC State. No one else was in on the skinny guard from tiny Farmville, North Carolina. A lot of schools now wish they had been. You know, he said his dream schools is, he named three dream schools and NC State was one of them and they were the first ones to offer and he didn't take them long to commit. Smith has led the Jaguars to back-to-back -back state championships and are a good bet to win another title this season. It's that winning spirit the Wolfpack head coach Kevin Keats likes, says Smith. Uh, he likes it. I'm tough. I don't back down for nobody. I'm not ducking nobody. I want to play against the best of the best. And I always leave it on the court 100%. Smith has helped Farmville Central bolt out to a 2 0 start to begin the year while averaging close to 30 points per contest. Impressive numbers from a player intent on leaving a legacy at a school known for basketball excellence. He, he has a chance to, to leave here as one of the most decorated basketball players that's ever stepped foot in here. And there's been some really, really good ones at Farmville Central. Boy, have they ever. Farmville Central has a rich basketball tradition, and Terquavian Smith is about to add his name to the list of great ones. Following the Wolfpack in Raleigh, I'm Todd Gibson. Can't wait to see him getting in the Wolfpack red. Next time we're going to see the NC State Wolfpack in action, it's going to be next Wednesday. Their game with Georgia Tech was scheduled this Saturday. It was postponed a couple hours ago due to COVID inside the Wolfpack program. Their next scheduled game will be against UVA on the 20th. And after putting it all together and taking down a tough NC State squad in Raleigh, the Miami Hurricanes had what can only be described as a letdown against Boston College. It started with a bad practice the day before. I mean, they were missing layups out there. Be careless. And it carried over. The Canes are a team that can't afford to be careless with all the players they have out. I mean, they're up to five guys now. Chris Likes, Dan Geck, Cameron McGusty, Sam Wardberg, Rodney Miller. Think about the guys I just named. That is a squad. Not to mention the minutes the other guys are having to play. I mean, it's going to wear down anyone. That and the scoring they're missing from these guys. Here's Coach to explain. I think it's the lack of, of Chris Likes and Cam McGusty's three-point shooting. Isaiah's a driver. But if you drive and kick and the guy can't make the shot, they're not helping on the drive. I mean, they're, they're helping, overhelping on the drive and forcing him to throw it to a guy who doesn't shoot threes. So, you know, we took 16 of them. But think back a month ago when we played, we were one for 17. We were three for 19. Now we're two for 16. When you count on guys to make threes that aren't there, you know, falls on someone else's uh, shoulders. And we're, we're just not good enough at making threes. 
Hurricanes now return home to Coral Gables, where they host Louisville Saturday at 8 at the Watts Coast Center. The next time the Canes hit the court will be next Tuesday against Syracuse. That tips at 7 in the Dome. And for a look at what the Orange have been up to, let's check it in with WYSR Steve Infante. Steve. Well, after tearing his meniscus in the season opener against Bryant, the hope was that Barama Sidibe would be able to return at the start of January. Barama was back practicing by the beginning of January, but as Jim Beheim said earlier in the week, he is simply just not ready to play in games right now. The senior center was expected to give it a go against Pitt last week, but experienced soreness in his knee after practice the day before the game, and so he sat out. And the Orange is certainly missing his inside presence. In each of its three losses this season, Syracuse has been out rebounded by at least 16 by the opponent. That was the story on Tuesday as North Carolina grabbed 24 offensive rebounds, leading to 24 second chance points. And that was easily the difference in an 81 75 setback in Chapel Hill. You know, they're a big team, they're difficult for us, and we have to play almost a, a Perfect. We played well on offense. We almost have to play a, a perfect game on offense. And, uh, you know, we didn't, we weren't perfect. We, we played pretty well, but we just got beat up in the pain. Next up is a rematch with Pittsburgh on Saturday. This one on the road. The Panthers rallied from down 18 inside the dome last week to steal one. 63 60 tip time set for noon at the Peterson Event Center. Covering Syracuse, I'm Stephen Fonte. Thank you, Steve. Another one of those noon tips. Lots of great basketball early in the day. Just make sure that you don't party too hard on Friday night to get up to catch all that cool stuff. And at this point, the Pitt Panthers, they just want to get on the floor. I mean, three of their last games have been postponed. Their most recent date, a date with Georgia, a game rather, a date with Georgia Tech. Looking hard for the silver lining here and at the prompter because it's moving fast. The only thing we can think of since there without Justin Champagne for the next three to five weeks. At least they're not losing the games that he's not playing in. I mean, it's something. It's saving their record. I mean, the mounting L's that may come from playing may. But anyway, explain that to the guys out there working out. That you can't. I mean, uh, that kid, they came to school there to play. Uh, they want the chance to show and prove. They can make an impact in the ACC. They want to show they can do this. It's beyond tough. When I told them Saturday after we finished practice that the Georgia Tech game uh, was going to be postponed, they were crushed. They were crushed, and I hurt for them. Um, and so it's something that they want to do and, 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 and play, and, and we've played pretty well, and so that's great. But, you know, going into these arenas with no fans, you know, there's no energy. Like, it's, it's, it's just empty. It's, and, and then, you know, every day waiting on test results, Seeing who you can have in practice, can you practice? You know who's going to be available, who can be available. Um, it's 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 not a lot of fun. That's three of the last four games were canceled. There, they did get one in. Give you some idea how things are going in Steeltown this weekend at the Peterson Event Center. It's the Panthers and the Orange at noon, like we said. That's followed up with a game against Coach Capel's alma mater. Duke and his old coach Mike Shashevsky the following Tuesday also at Peterson Event Center. So at least got a couple of home games in there coming up, coach. Keeping with the COVID cancellation, the team pit was supposed to play Georgia Tech. They didn't just get the game postponed. They paused all basketball activities after that one. I mean, they're a good team when they can get on the court. Two and one in conference play, six and three overall, beat Kentucky and North Carolina in the same month. That's rolling. But with their last three games put off, I mean, uh, who knows when they're going to be made up. Uh, to say it's a setback is an understatement. I mean, he had a foolproof way of dealing with this coach did with COVID early on, but it wasn't helping their win-loss record. It'll, here he explains. Before we started playing Georgia State and Mercer, our first two games, I didn't do any contact practices leading up to that the entire time for, you know, basically two months. And because of that, we were able to get to the games. And we would, and, and if I continued that, we would not be shut down. But because we've gone to contact practices, um, that has, you know, and when you have a, 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 a positive, you're going to get shut down. And that's what happened to us. Now, if I continue that, I thought we were going to be 0 and 27. We would not have won a game because <laughs> we were not good those first two games, but we got to the games. So. Don't practice, but you can play the games and maybe lose. Or practice, you might not play the games, but you'll have a better shot. That is an 
terrible equation. Next game on the docket for Georgia Tech was their date with NC State this week, and that was postponed. Follows a positive test, subsequent quarantine contact tracing within the Wolfpack program. The next time Georgia Tech scheduled to take the court isn't until next Wednesday, January 20th, when they take on Clemson at Camish Pavilion. Hopefully, fingers crossed. And fresh off a big win over NC State, the Tigers were on a roll, ranked 12th in the latest poll, looking forward to adding to their win total. COVID got them too, forcing them to postpone last Saturday's game in North Carolina. This Tuesday's date was Syracuse. And we're going to check in now with WSPA's Pete Yandy to see how the Tigers are handling the shutdown. Pete. The Clemson Tigers had had some games impacted this season because of the pandemic, but during the past week, they experienced a postponement due to an issue of their own when their contests at North Carolina and a subsequent ball game at Syracuse were knocked out. After a Friday announcement of a COVID issue within the Tiger team, the plan was to get back to practice on Wednesday, and everything appears to be still a go for the contest on Saturday against the Virginia Cavaliers. The Tigers moving up to number 12 in the rankings this week, and a Clemson ball club that head coach Brad Brownell is trying simply to endure the challenge of getting ready for their ACC games and all else going on around them. It's not just the teams and the games is, you know, I just think this is this is challenging times for players, and it probably brings an added uh, element as a coach that you're kind of always worried about your guys mentally and being fresh. And there's just a lot of challenges. We got a saying in a wall in our office: "Dream big, focus small." And so that's a good thing, I think. But dreaming big is good as long as you are focusing small on the details. What's right in front of you, understanding why you're doing what you're doing, what it takes to get where you want to go. Tigers will hit the court Saturday with a 9 and 1 overall record, a 3 and 1 mark in the ACC. Those three wins, one in overtime, another by a point at Miami among them. Covering the Clemson Tigers, I'm Pete Yannity. Thank you, Pete. Tigers, like you said, finally getting back in the court after being off for 10 days this weekend. Hopefully, when they host the Virginia Cavaliers, tip off of that one is set for 6 p.m. Next up, we're talking about the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. Had a tough one against Duke where they never, ever, I mean, I think it's been since like 92 since they won a game at Cameron Indoor. And then they faced another squad that just straight rolled them over. And it just wasn't a very, very good week for the Demon Deacons. But. Never given up. Brand new head coach. Got a whole new type of thing going on up there in Winston-Salem. WGHP's Kevin Conley has more to tell you about it. Whenever there is a coaching change like there was at Wake Forest this offseason, there is a sense of hope that the new coach will be able to turn things around. It just never happens fast enough for fans. But through a handful of ACC games, you get a glimpse of how the Demon Deacons will play under Steve Forbes going forward. Now, despite the record, there are plenty of reasons for hope that one day, the Demon Deacons will be able to compete. Take the game on Wednesday night against number 16 Louisville, for example. Freshman point guard Carter Witt was unable to play after he rolled his ankle in pregame warmups. But that didn't stop the Demon Deacons from giving the Cardinals all they could handle. Davion Williamson scored 19 points to lead the Deacons. He was one of three players in double figures. Now, Wake trailed by one with 12 minutes to go in this game, but couldn't get that go-ahead basket. 77-68 the final score. It is Wake's fourth straight loss. All in all, you know, our kids competed hard against a nationally ranked team, but at the end we still have a loss. And uh, so we've got to learn from it. We've got another uh, nationally ranked team, Virginia Tech, coming here on Sundays playing a Playing really well, with a lot of confidence, just beat Duke at home. So we got our work cut out for us, but these kids will keep plugging. And um, I look forward to coaching them at the next practice. We work really hard in practice. Um, we were coached really well. You know, we're, we're all together as a team, and I think we're we're close to making that next step, that next push. But we have faith in each other and in the team and the coaches. So. You know, it's going to come. It's going to happen. Wake Forest will try and get that first ACC conference win on Sunday against Virginia Tech. Covering the Demon Deacons, I'm Kevin Conley. Thank you, Kevin. Like you just said, next bite at the apple for when comes in a rare Sunday game against Virginia Tech, who's on a bit of a roll as of late. That one in Winston-Salem.
Well, another exciting week of college basketball. Some great games last night, some even better ones on the way this weekend, so we don't lose our shirts here this weekend. Let's bring on Jason Logan of Covers.com to make sense of the odds here. And Jason, the Louisville Cardinals have only one loss on the season. That coming at Wisconsin and ranked number 16th in the AP poll are the Cards not getting the credit they deserve heading into this Saturday's trip to Miami. Yeah, Louisville definitely picking up steam heading into the weekend here. The Cardinals had a nice win over Virginia Tech earlier in the month. And then while the wins over Wake and BC aren't that noteworthy, they did come on the road. So, you know, you got to give them a little bit of credit there. Chris Mack has one of the least experienced teams in the country. But when you're Louisville, those youngsters have such a high ceiling. And they mature very, very quickly. UL still has some bad habits, though. Uh, they're letting teams kind of hang around, and they need some consistent efforts from their stars every night. Um, it's a tough spot in Miami this weekend, and a bit of a mental challenge for this young Cardinals team. This is going to be their second straight road game, and it's also their third road trip in the past two weeks. And then from the sports betting perspective, we're always looking for those situational spots, those situational matchups. And this one could be a bit of a look ahead spot for the Cardinals. Uh, and that's where we find you well. They got a home date against Florida State on Monday, and then they're hosting Duke at home next weekend. So may look past the Hurricanes here. Miami has been able to play up to the level of competition. They've covered against some, some quality ACC foes in Virginia Tech, UNC, and Clemson. Uh, but then they went and laid an egg against Boston College last time. I would say. They're dealing with some injuries in the backcourt. Cameron McGusty and Chris Likes, who did practice this week, they're missing two of those top guards. So you want to keep an eye on their status heading into this game into the weekend here. Miami's probably going to be catching the points at home here. So maybe if you can get that info and then beat the, beat the book to the best number, uh, look to the Canes. Now after a bumpy start to ACC play and missed opportunities in the non-conference schedule, North Carolina has strung together three straight wins, albeit very close wins, but they're still wins nonetheless. What's different about this Tar Heels squad as they visit Florida State Saturday? Yeah, we'll be a little cautiously optimistic with the Tar Heels here since they did fail to cover in two of those three games that we're talking about. However, it does appear, appear that UNC is tightening the bolts here when in terms of turnovers, during this three game span. Ahead of the three game winning streak, UNC was coughing up the ball 16.2 times per game. That ranked 301st in the country. That's not very good. Uh, and that included 18 turnovers and that loss to Georgia Tech on December 30th. But since then, UNC has slimmed down that average uh, down to 13 turnovers per game, just 11 turnovers in the win over Syracuse on Tuesday. Uh, Tar Heels. They pulled away in crunch time in that game, and they picked up their first ACC win by more than five points, which was significant because they covered the five-point spread. Um, this trip to Tallahassee is going to be a test for that improved turnover margin. Given UNC averages more than 17 turnovers on the road compared to just 11.4 at home this season, and the Knowles, a much better defense at home, too. They average 15 forced turnovers per game at home. They give up only 67.9 points at home, which is nine points less than they do on the road. FSU just smashed the uh, NC State here on Wednesday, despite a two-week hiatus due to the COVID outbreaks. Uh, Leonard Hamilton, he shook up their starting lineup. He jump-started the shooting for the Seminoles as well, too. They went 12 for 18 from beyond the arc, uh, dropped 105 points on the pack here. So North Carolina needs to take care of the basketball. They got to get their heels above the three-point line. Uh, but they have had success against this team. They're 4 0 and 1 ATS against the spread in the last five matchups with Florida State. All right, big ACC showdown this weekend. Sees number 18 Virginia facing number 12 Clemson. How should basketball betters approach this matchup? And maybe tread lightly with Clemson here. Here's a team that had a ton of momentum rolling into conference play, uh, but a COVID outbreak kind of canned their last two matchups. And this team hasn't seen action since beating NC State on January 5th. Uh, the Tigers have seven wins over major conference opponents on the year. Very, very good. Uh, and they boast the top defense in the country, according to Ken Palm's defensive efficiency rating, which is one of those key metrics when measuring a team's tournament success. They face another program that's routinely at the top of that data board as well, too. And that's Virginia. They rank 13th in defensive efficiency right now. The Cavs on the opposite end of the momentum scale, though. They're coming off an impressive home win over Notre Dame on Wednesday. Virginia starting to complement that shutdown defense with some offense as well, too. Uh, Virginia's covered in three of its last four games. So if you are betting the Cavs in this one, I think you're going to want to jump on them early uh, before the live moves up too big. It's going to come out around Friday night. Uh, as for the total, given the defensive standing of both of these programs, I think the under is going to be the popular bet. Crunching the numbers so we don't have to. He is Jason Logan of Covers.com. Thank you as always, Jason. All right, thanks. Enjoy the games. 
Now, it's uh, great that the NCAA is looking into a bubble in Indiana to keep everybody as safe as they can to try and play the NCAA tournament. But, but what about the teams that are going to be invited is the question. I mean, with college football, it's a little bit easier to pick them out. You could you give some of them the eye test and really just take the conference champs. But what about basketball? Sure, you take the tournament champs, it's automatics, but then, then we get into some issues. A minimum for games played was set at 13, and most are going to make that. But where do you start drawing the line at who's in and who's out? I mean, do you lean more heavily on the teams in big conferences like the ACC as opposed to mid majors? Uh, looking at win loss records, strength of schedule, selection for this year's big dance is going to be a mess. And I feel sorry for the people making the call this year. So do the coaches. A team could be nine and four, and another team could be. 12 and 8. Well, who's better? I mean, I mean, you know, is a team that's played 13 games or, or, or 20? And, and so you just don't know. And I think it's going to be a little bit of a crapshoot. Yeah, I have no clue. I, I, I really don't know. Um, so I'm not going to sit up here and pretend like I know what they're going to do. I think people, you know, look at your record and decide whether you're good or not. And, and it's really not the case. It depends on who you played. When you played them? Do you take the eye test? Do you, I mean, non-conference is not non-conference. You know, typically we would have 11 non-conference games to have a sample size of who we get a chance to play. How much do you weigh the conference games? If it's not cleared up on how you're selecting teams, it could be a big time unbalance of what happens in, you know, on selection Sunday. And with COVID-19, it's an abnormal day when we don't have a game postponed. Now they all say postponed as they intend to try and make them up in the future. Right now, by my count, there's 16 games that have been put off during football season. They had a few buy dates to make games up. But as basketball season progresses, the weeks start to fill up, and there's just no time. It's just January, but teams like Pittsburgh are starting to feel the crunch as they come down the stretch. And, and they have, uh, I mean, how many games put off already, Coach Cable? Yeah, it's four. Um, and we have a makeup date for one, and so it's going to be it, it, it's going to be difficult. You know, the league will try to do it. You know, we'll try to do it. But I think every week you're going to see who's available to play, and I, I think there could be a shakeup every week. I think there could be some changes every week. For us, we follow whatever the doctors, our medical team tells us. That's what we do. Um, if, if if you have to play three games in a week and that's what it takes, and it works out medically with the testing and things like that. I'm, 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 I'm fine with that. And along with college players being able to transfer easier now, we're also seeing players enroll earlier due to COVID-19. Large areas of the country have shut down high school seasons altogether. So what are some of the top talents in the nation doing? They're enrolling in school now so they can play at the next level instead of waiting. College football has done it for years. Players enroll in January. They're able to participate in spring football, then take that red shirt year off. They're called gray shirts. But here's what coaches are saying about the practice for basketball. I personally would never have the idea myself of leaving my high school team that I've played with forever all the way through grade school or whatever and leave my buddies to, uh, to go do that. But uh, I'm not the typical prospect out there now. But uh, you can't play in high school, and if you really love to play basketball and want to see how your game's coming along and you have big-time dreams about it, uh, you know, kids want to go play. I've got no problem with that. You know, maybe even when we come out of the pandemic, maybe like football kids, maybe kids will just do that, you know, in, in basketball. I, I think like kind of the, uh, you know, the genie's out of the bottle, so to speak, on, on this particular thing. I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of movement and uh, every program is going to have to be aware of like losing somebody you didn't think you might and having to go get a player in the summer, spring, or summertime. And uh, it's good freedom for the players. I'm for it. Safe to say this season is uh, unprecedented. All right, let's check those standings out and see how things are breaking down right now. Obviously, Louisville on top in this thing with Virginia Tech and Virginia Clemson all bunched up there at the top. Go ahead and break out the next ones there. Duke right behind them. You're talking about Florida State, Pitt, and Georgia Tech. It's just a giant, giant blob, glom, whatever you want to call it. UNC checking in right there, three and two, followed by NC State, Syracuse, and Miami. And of course, let's not forget the ones that are still pushing and struggling along there. Boston College, win number one. 
Win two in a row, it's called a streak. You can do it, fellas. I know Jim Christian's pushing. Wake Forest and Notre Dame still looking for that first ACC win. Thanks for joining us on Chase for the Championship. Everybody, remember, you can watch a brand new episode every Thursday night right here. And until next week, get out there, watch some basketball. I'll see you all next Thursday.